Hello again, everybody. It's time for the Silver Bullets podcast once again. I am Michael Citro. And I'm Chip Minnick. Chip, we did not need to worry about the Purdue Boilermakers as much as we might have thought that we needed to worry about the Purdue Boilermakers. Yeah, I'm happy to be mistaken uh, that Ohio State took care of business. And, uh, you know, if anything, uh, you know, I think some of the concerns that came out of the win defensively um, are warranted, but I'm put me in the camp of that. It's not anything that Ohio state uh, needs to really be overly concerned about as they come down the final uh, final few games of the regular season. Yeah. So first of all, we're recording a little later in this week than we normally do. We had some uh, other commitments this week, so we're a little late. We apologize for that, but uh, you know, good things come to those who wait, right, Chip? Precisely. Yeah. I, if anything, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad that uh, we were able to move some things around because we did have some other obligations that we had to take care of. So, yeah, like you said, better late than never. <laughs> All right. So the Buckeyes played Purdue at home and rolled to a 59-31 victory. It was it was fairly easy and fairly comprehensive overall, but it, there were some annoying parts of the game where the defense couldn't get stops, and that, that has been an issue on and off this season. And to me, it looked like there wasn't a lot of change on the defense. There wasn't a lot of blitzing. It didn't look like there were a lot of different types of looks. It just looked like they lined up and said, this is how we're going to present ourselves against Purdue, and we'll see what happens. It didn't look like there was a lot of fancy stuff going on out there. I would agree with that. I, I mean, it was... I agreed with something I read online from Joshua Perry uh, that, you know, the fact that they never sacked uh, Purdue's quarterback even once, you know, with all of those pass attempts. But I agree with what you just said. I think that they kind of went into it with the mindset of this is what we're going to do and we're not going to, you know, try and do anything exotic, so to speak. I think they were just kind of they, they knew that. Purdue was going to throw the ball and that they felt comfortable with what they were doing defensively to be able to, if not necessarily outright stop it, uh, slow it down considerably. Yeah, I don't know if that was just a, a case of wanting to you know, prevent a big play or what they were doing there, but uh, they, they definitely, the defensive line didn't cover itself in glory. The, the pass rush you just touched on, there wasn't one. Uh, and they didn't do a lot of extra blitzing or bring a lot of extra guys or do anything really exotic, as you put it. They didn't uh, particularly do well stopping the run, although I would imagine every single play they just approached it like this is a passing down, and then that's an easy way for Purdue to get some yards you know, on run, on run plays because you're just saying, we're not going to worry about them. They're not going to run consistently, so we're just going to line up and, and try to play every down like it's a passing down. Right. I precisely. I think uh yeah, the 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 running yardage that Purdue accumulated it was more than I anticipated. But again, I think Ohio State kind of looked at it like these guys are just going to throw the ball um pretty much almost every down, so I think stopping the run was I wouldn't even call it a secondary thought. I would <laughs> I would say it was like further on down the line. Uh you know, in terms of like just trying to keep them out of the end zone. Uh, you know, trying to capitalize on, uh, you know, uh, making sure that Purdue did not uh, ever threaten Ohio State. Yeah, and I think for the most part, you'd have to say it worked. I don't know that you would want to necessarily do that every time, but they just said, hey, this is a plan we're we're going with, and, and they came out and executed it, and it worked, and they you know, they raced out to a pretty early big lead. They They led 21-7. After the first quarter, Garrett Wilson getting involved early in this game, 21-yard pass from C.J. Stroud uh, in the first quarter. Uh, first of all, congratulations, uh, Ohio State actually, I think, won the toss in this game? I think so, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's the second time all year. So maybe the law of average is coming back a little bit. Um, Purdue answered with a 25-yard pass from Aiden O'Connell to Anthrop make it 7-7, seven, seven, and then uh, Travion Henderson 
with a three-yard touchdown run, and then Travion Henderson with a 57-yard burst. And it was a it was a good day for Travion early. They they didn't use him a whole lot after I don't know, like even in the second half, they didn't really seem to use him a whole lot. They they gave Mayan Williams a lot more carries uh, in the second half than uh, than Henderson. Yeah, I um, it, it seems as though that they are continuing with their strategy of trying to I don't want to say minimize Travion Henderson, but not overdo the usage of Travion Henderson unless it's absolutely necessary. And they must have felt that this was as good an opportunity as any to get Mayan Williams reacclimated into the flow of the offense. Yeah, no Master Teague in this game. No. So, um, yeah, th- so it was good that Mayan was able to come back and, and get some yards and, and have some success in this game. Travion Henderson on a pitch count, apparently. Yeah, it seems like it. I mean, that's only... That's the only thing I can I can think of is that all right he he was playing as you said you know playing very well, but they must be thinking all right we want to make sure even with games on the horizon hopefully a Big Ten championship hopefully a college football playoff berth that he's fully rested and ready to go when and if they need to give him even more carries than they have been in these games. Yeah, the Buckeyes then extended the lead. By a couple of more touchdowns, Jackson Smith and Jigba went 20 yards uh, on a pass from Stroud, and uh, Garrett Wilson scored from 12 yards out. It was 35-7 to at that point, and it was cruise control. Oh, yeah. I mean, it. by and large, you know, it was – the game was, for all intents and purposes, was done at halftime. Um, now, I realize that Purdue – you know, to their credit in the second, you know, like second half, you know, that they kept firing and, you know, kept scoring, which meant Ohio state kept scoring. Um, but you know, by and large, the game, this game was over at halftime. Yeah. Purdue did get one back on a 12 yard pass, um, in the second quarter. And then Garrett Wilson went on a jet sweep for 51 yards to make it 42, 14 Purdue tacked on a field goal. And that's your halftime score, 45. Sorry, it's not. Ruggles hit a field goal at the end of the half. Uh, 45, or 40, yeah, 45 to 17 was the halftime score. And, yeah, you were definitely not concerned about Purdue getting back in the game. No. I mean, it it, it was the kind of thing where, um, like you said, Purdue, I mean, they were scoring, but they had the turnovers that Ohio State was able to capitalize upon in the first half. Ohio State was moving the ball both on the ground and in the air. Uh, you know, I never, ever thought, okay, this game, you know, looks like it's going to be a back and forth, um, you know, pretty much from the second quarter on. Yeah, Purdue tried some things in this game that didn't come off, and um, it looked like Ohio State was ready for the trick plays. Maybe more than they were ready for some of Purdue's base plays, but um, they come out in the second half, and – you know, you want to start off strong and uh, Garrett Wilson scored again and it was 52-17. And then Purdue had some success offensively the next couple of drives and they were able to uh, to get a couple touchdowns back on uh, a couple more touchdown passes from Aiden O'Connell. And then Chris Olave uh, got his touchdown early in the fourth quarter and that was it for the scoring. It's funny because you think of it, it just seemed like Purdue was having so much success offensively and they did score 31 points, but they didn't score in the fourth quarter. Right. I mean, it, it just seemed as though, okay, you know, like Ohio state, I don't, I don't, I guess the only, the only thing I can say is they, they kind of took their, they, they as a team kind of took their foot off the gas, but I keep going back to that. Like I never, ever from where I was watching it, I never, ever thought like, okay, it's starting to be concerning. Yeah. Um, you know, so it, I mean, it was kind of a strange game, but I mean, it, based on the nervousness that I had going into it, you know, okay, this is a team that, you know, w- when it came to Iowa and Michigan state, um, they had their, you know, like they seemingly had their way with both of those teams. I never, ever, that never, ever crossed my mind, um, uh, this past Saturday against Ohio state. 
I, I believe one of the broadcasters at one point said something like, uh, oh, don't look now, but if Purdue punches it in here, they're back within three scores. <laughs> and I'm like, well, yeah. that's, that's three yeah. scores. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's exactly it. Like, okay, you're just trying to, you're trying to stoke the flames of controversy and get, you know, like, okay, within three scores. Yeah. You know, that, that's kind of, I mean, that's a statement right there. Exactly. It's like, well, that sounds really dumb the way you said it because, right. um, yeah, that's like saying, well, all they need is, you know, five more touchdowns and the two point conversion. And boy, they're Mercer's right back in this game against Bama. There you go. You there know, you go. It's just, just not, not good. But I think it was a cathartic win. Uh, the, the bad taste in Ohio State fans' mouth from the last meeting in West Lafayette has been lingering for years. It's been something that Purdue fans have gleefully uh, bantered about online. And, you know, that was a very – it was a bad loss for Ohio State, obviously, for a number of reasons. But I never discount the emotion of, an, of, a, of a college football team. And that Purdue team – was playing for a dying fellow student and they played like it that that night and they took it to Ohio State. Ohio State had no answers. And so kudos to them, but it's not like Purdue beats Ohio State regularly. And there was all of that pregame talk about, oh, look what they did against this top-ranked team and this top-ranked team, you know, the the Iowa game and the, the Michigan State game, conveniently left out the loss to Notre Dame. Um because they had to manufacture the 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 uh, the upset, but here is a 19th ranked team in the country. It's not unheard of for a 19th ranked team in the country to beat a top five team, right? And one of the things I think one of the biggest differences between this year's team and the 2018 that lost at Purdue is even though both of these teams uh, have, I should say, both teams have and that and that 2018 had defensive issues the 2021 team granted they're not solved i don't know if they will be solved Mm -hmm. but this this year's coaching staff unlike the 2018 staff seemed to you know i mean early on in the season make moves to adjust and try to improve the defense that 2018 Ohio State team defensively, they just never ever really got it figured out. Yeah. So that's uh, that's a wrap on Purdue. Uh, crisis averted, fifty nine thirty one. If we look at our predictions, Chip, you will find that we are splitting this again because uh, you were closer to the Purdue score and I was closer to the Ohio State score, and so we we split the uh, profits here. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> I had forty two twenty six, you had thirty eight twenty eight. So I we both underestimated the Ohio State offense getting back on track. Uh they did a very good job of mixing the run with the pass this week. Um you know, I don't know, maybe Ryan Day was just trying some stuff in that you know, in the last couple of games, but you know, they he got back to, to showing some balance. The offense had whatever it wanted, whenever it wanted, it seemed like. And, you know, C.J. Stroud was firing, and the receivers were all playing really great, as they usually do. Travion Henderson was doing Travion Henderson things. And it was, you know, some, some rough moments for the defense. But, again, I, I don't think that they ever really ha- came up against a problem in this game that they needed to solve. It was, we have a big lead. Let's just make them go down the field slowly and see if they can put enough plays together to score and to produce credit they did it. Yeah, and you know the 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 guy that on Purdue that we were both concerned about was David Bell. Yeah. And he had I mean and he had a I'm not I don't want to take anything he's a good player. He is I mean I'm I'm just speculating that um he will probably declare for the 2022 NFL draft and be a high selection, mm-hmm. uh, you know, good, very good player. Could win the Bolitnikov. Um, he could very well. Um, and I would say, you know, it would certainly be deserving. But in contrast with what he did against Ohio State, I think he 
I mean, like, I think he had 11 receptions. I don't have the stats in front of me. Yep. But he really didn't, you know, like, it, it, I think in terms of the yardage, I mean, he didn't really do the damage that he did against Iowa and Michigan State. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, for all of the criticism of the defense, oh, you know, like they gave up 31 points and, and all these yards and, you know, they really didn't suffer the same kind of dr- dramatic defensive meltdowns that the Hawkeyes and the Spartans did. So that mm-hmm. uh, against David Bell. So I'm, I'm happy with that. Yeah, I mean, they he had 11 catches for 103 yards, which sounds like a big day. But for David Bell, that's not a terribly big day. They targeted him 17 times. So I think they they did do some damage control with David Bell in big plays. They were just like, okay, he's going to catch some passes possession type you know extend drives type thing but it wasn't going to be he's going to make that catch on the run cut up field and make a big play right I mean the you know again they you know Aiden O'Connell you know he (laughs) I mean he was going to throw the ball um, you know all over the place and kind of what we had talked about it's like okay as long as uh they're not getting in the end zone. Now, granted, 31 points is nothing to sneeze at, but um, by and large, it wasn't nearly the, the kind of prolific passing onslaught that I guess, I don't want to say that I expected, but more that I was dreading. Mm-hmm. And and that's the thing is that I think Ohio State, um, they bent a lot, but they never really truly broke um, in, in the sense that the defense was – you know, the, the main culprit of, you know, like a, what would have been a, a crushing loss. The, yeah. the defense played well enough when it had to, and the offense, as you said, they, they pretty much were able to do whatever, whatever and whenever they wanted. Yeah, it would have been interesting to have seen if in a tighter game, would they, would the defensive coaching staff have played, you know, tried to change some things up? Would they have sent some blitzes? Would they have tried some different things? They really didn't ever have to do that, so they never did. And like I said, they just they built their lead and said, okay, when we're on defense, we're just going to do this and limit the damage and, you know, see if they can put together a 10 or 11 play drive. And Purdue did it a couple of times, but they couldn't do it consistently. Yeah, I mean, Purdue, um, in terms of and, and another player um, to kind of switch over defensively, uh, you know, on the on the defensive side, George Karloftis wasn't nearly as much of a of, of a factor, uh, you know, like on the Purdue defense. Mm-hmm. I was going to bring know. that up because we had both oh, okay. talked about him. Um, not that not that I don't want you to finish your thought. We had both talked about him, uh, you know, extensively last week and how he sometimes seemed unblockable in games that we've seen, but. He was extremely quiet in this game. Right. I mean, that, that was kind of, I guess, my larger point. I mean, I already raised it about David Bell, is that all of the concerns, you know, like centered around David Bell and George Karloftis never really materialized. Yeah. Uh, you know, like it, it was pretty much, like you said, Karloftis was pretty quiet. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, it was one of these things where I, I can't recall where I saw it. Um, it might have been Ross Ross Fulton um, from Buckeye Scoop pointing it out, but you mentioned earlier the the touchdown run by Garrett Wilson that it was because uh, that Karloftis was actually out of position, you know, like that uh, that that's why you know Wilson was able to turn up field instead of you know being possibly tackled for a loss. I mean, it was one of these things where he was not in the right position and, and Garrett Wilson was able to, you know, score running the ball, mm-hmm. um, you know, so, and I'm not, I'm not mocking him by any stretch. I'm just saying that kind of to my point from a moment ago that neither David Bell nor George Karloftis were nearly as much of, you know, impacting factors as we probably thought they were going to be. Right. They would have been, if we picked, if we had picks to click on for the opposition, they would have been unanimous choices. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Very, very well said. So let's talk about our picks to click. Let's talk first about the rushing game. Mayan Williams actually was the top runner for Ohio State, 117 yards on 14 carries. That's an 8.4-yard average. Travion Henderson ran for 98. 
and two touchdowns, seven and a half yards per carry. Mayan Williams just he just wore Purdue out. I mean, they they just couldn't tackle him like they were tired. They were out on the field running around a lot on defense and you know, I would I would assume there's not a lot of substituting going on on the Purdue defense, not a deep defense. Um and when you're getting, you know, beaten down by essentially five tackles across the offensive line all day, uh it makes it difficult and then uh you get softened up by Travion Anderson and then then when you're when you're tired, they they throw in Mayan Williams and Chop will will not go down easily as we saw in this game. Uh, Trayvon Anderson was my pick to click, and I would say that he clicked. Oh, certainly, without a doubt. Um, he didn't. I mean, we we mentioned earlier he didn't play as extensively as we thought he would, or that he may need uh, me may, may have needed to be. Mm-hmm. Um, but he certainly did. Absolutely. Yeah. I will say one thing about the, the Purdue being able to score 31 is that it probably prevented a lot of backups from getting on the field, especially on offense. Yeah, that's that was kind of unfortunate that, you know, these are the kind of games where ordinarily you would think, okay, like this is a perfect time for Kyle McCord or, mm-hmm. uh, you know, any, you know, any of the other, you know, young players uh, that regardless of whether we're talking on offense or defense that, you would like to, you know, some of the wide receivers, for example, that we've seen earlier in the year. Um, yeah, it is kind of unfortunate that with Purdue continuing to score, you know, Ryan Day probably felt like, okay, I need to keep everybody in just in case, mm-hmm. uh, you know, something kind of goes awry. Yeah, they were able to get some offensive linemen backups in at times, but, um, you know, you, I had people when it was uh, third quarter, I had people saying, oh, when are we going to see uh, Ewers? You know, I don't, I don't, <laughs> know, I don't know that we're going to see Ewers in this game, but, you know, it, we 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 didn't really get to the point where you got to see a ton of, of backups in this game. Uh, on the receiving end, Garrett Wilson with a huge day. Uh, you called it. He was your pick to click. Coming back from the game off, and he had 126 yards receiving and three touchdowns. Plus, he had the rushing touchdown. Plus, he had uh, was interfered with in the end zone that wasn't called. So he had a big day. Yeah, I mean, he definitely. Uh, not to sound like an alarmist for 2022, um, you know, but the speculation is that you know he's going to declare for the NFL draft, be a high selection. Um, and we kind of, you know, we saw, you know, the, the previous week against Nebraska, you know, his absence, how that impacted Ohio State's offense. And, and then obviously in a positive way, the dramatic impact he had coming back with such a strong performance against Purdue. So uh, it'll be interesting to see, you know, what direction Ohio State goes when Garrett Wilson is no longer a Buckeye because, I mean, he, he certainly made his mark this past Saturday. Yeah. Jackson Smith and Jigba had another big day, 139 yards, receiving on nine catches, one touchdown. Chris Olave, 85 yards and a touchdown, got absolutely jobbed out of a beautiful long touchdown catch. Yeah, I I agree. I mean, that holding call was pretty chintzy, I mean, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> that was bad. That was very, very bad. All right, uh, let us look at the defense then, Chip. On the defensive side of the ball, uh, you had Steel Chambers this week, and I had Ronnie Hickman. So uh, well, let me see where are we, where are we at? Where's our tackle? Where, where are my tackle stats? Where are my tackles? There they are. Okay. Uh, Ronnie Hickman was third on the team in tackles with seven, and Steel Chambers only had four. But I think Steel Chambers played really well in this game. He did, and I I I, I know you have it if not in front of you, I know nearby, I think he graded out a champion. I mean, there weren't many on the defensive side. So um, I'm going to leave it up to you. I mean, I think if there is anything that I'm happy about with steel chambers, regardless of, you know, you know, like being designated a champion or not, it looks like finally that the coaching staff, I think he started at linebacker. Mm-hmm. Um, so my point being that, okay, finally, you know, it, it, it kind of has dawned on them. Okay. I don't care that this guy was a running back, you know, 
for the majority of his career. He's yeah. the best linebacker on the roster. We should play him accordingly. Yeah. He's he's the best linebacker on the team as far as I'm concerned. And he he did in fact grade out as a champion. So you are correct. I'm gonna give him a click. And even though Ronnie Hickman had seven tackles was third on the team, I'm not gonna give him a click. I, I thought okay. there were too many uh too many blown coverages in this game. Okay. I, so I, I think I, I leave it to your I leave it to your discretion. I think he's so, got to he's got to bear some of the blame for as a safety for some of the blown coverages. I, I think it's uh you know that's a that secondary is a, is a unit. They have to work as a unit. It takes more than one person to leave somebody as open as some of those Purdue receivers were. Okay. So there you have it. It was um, I thought even though he gave up some some receptions. I thought Denzel Burke had a particularly good game defensively because he's the one that was tasked with being on an Island with, with bell. Oh yeah. I, I think, you know, they did not obviously listen to me about trying to deploy the bill Belichick, you know, defensive strategy, <laughs> you know, um, but in all seriousness, yeah, I think Denzel Burke, uh, you know, how, when you think back to not that he was, terrible or atrocious but you know in game one he had his struggles you know mm-hmm. against you know when he was on the road at minnesota and think look just look like the season isn't done yet like just the the strides that he has made i mean he is arguably ohio state's best corner i mean you could make an argument for that so i mean the, the future is very bright for him uh you know especially what we've seen so far in 2021 yeah um one thing I should mention is that even though we talked about Steel Chambers uh, only having four tackles, he had one and a half tackles for loss. There you go. So okay. not too shabby. Zach Harrison had two, and Bryson Shaw had a half a one, and that I think accounts for. No, they, Lathan Ranson had a half a one. I was going to say, yep. uh, and and Eichenberg had a half a one. So that that accounts for five total tackles for eight. Eight yards lost out of five tackles for loss. That's not much. That's not much loss. <laughs> no, no, not at all. But again, you know, it's, I, I think they kind of what we said earlier. I think that they realized what kind of an offense that they weren't going to necessarily be able to effectively shut it down completely. So they kind of looked at it's like as long as we can, you know, try to minimize big plays. Um, you know, try to keep them out in the end zone. Now, granted, as I said earlier, you know, 31 points, um, that's a lot. But mm-hmm. when you're, when you're, you know, when you're outscoring Purdue, you know, substantially, I mean, it's, it, it's not as, it's not as glaring of an issue in my estimation. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And again, we, we don't really know what adjustments they might've made had they been forced to make adjustments. They really just never had to, had to worry about it. The game was pretty much over, uh, like you said, by halftime. So the Purdue game is over. We will turn our attention toward Michigan State. We'll have our uh, our breakdown segment a little later. We'll have our picks to click. We'll have our score predictions and all of that against Sparty. And we'll, of course, take our walk through the Big Ten as well. Before we take our break, just want to mention that um, we have uh, – we have we had a little bit of a of a I don't know what you would even call this um, whining by Jamison Williams. <laughs> yeah, I, I I saw that. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I, I'm I'm very surprised. Um, I I know that he left under unhappy circumstances. I would strongly dispute his claim of events the way that the, the, I, I, I just think that it's just uh, surprising. Yeah. I've, I've not heard any, and maybe you, maybe you have a different perspective. I have not heard or seen online of any Ohio state fans disparaging him. Um, if anything like that, they've been, you know, kind of lamenting, Oh man, you know, it's too bad it didn't work out here, um, you know. But no, I mean it's just surprising. Yeah. So for those who hadn't heard the story, he he had said, I guess it was on Instagram or somewhere. He had mentioned that he, Ohio State fans disowned him when he signed with Bama, 
Uh, when he transferred to Bama, they disowned him and they didn't want anything to do with him. And okay, well, first of all, I, my first question is, what do you expect? It's Alabama. It's not exactly a favorite of of. You can say that about any school in the country. If any school lost a player to Alabama, would they be happy about that chip? No, not at all. No. I, I I will merely say that as memory serves, he was he was strongly considering that team up north. Now, there you go. Like if if he had gone there, absolutely. yeah, then then he's disowned. <laughs> then, then, then he's, he's disowned. Yeah. yeah. You, know, you know, but I don't. I mean, if anything, it was kind of I, – I seem to recall thinking like, okay, great, the rich get richer. Yeah. Uh, you know, like, okay, you know, like, oh, poor poor Bama. You know, like you yeah. lose, you know, all this talent in the NFL draft, and now you get a, a guy that's arguably, you know, <laughs> just, as, just as good as these guys that you're losing. Yeah. Well, the thing is nobody at Ohio State, or at least, you know, outside the program, knew that Jamison Williams could do what he did this year because we haven't seen him. Right. Yeah. I mean, I mean it's he... not like, I mean, it's not like we didn't really know you, Jamison. We didn't know anything really about you. It was very, I mean, court, everybody knows quarterbacks, quarterback. Like if you compare it to the situation to Joe Burrow, everybody knew who Joe Burrow was. And there were some people that thought, Hey, Joe Burrow, he could start here one day. And Jamison William was, or Williams was a guy who is, a highly recruited receiver, highly rated receiver in a full room of highly decorated receivers. And it was like, you know, you can't get on the field here. We don't know who you are. I don't know if there was an incident that, that led to this. Did, is he mad because he lost a bunch of followers on Twitter or something? I don't know. I guess the way I remember it is, I mean, because he did. I mean, he he played. I mean, I, you know, he he made a big play against Clemson last year in the Sugar Bowl. You know, I mean, he had mm-hmm. a long touchdown. Um, you know, he, you know, was was playing a role, but he was dramatically overshadowed by Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave. Yeah. Then again, every other receiver on the team last year was dramatically overshadowed by, you know, Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave. Sure. Then in the spring, somewhere along the line. The coaches, you know, in their in their estimation, said Jackson Smith and Jigba can fill this role, and they told, okay, Jameson Williams, you're gonna you're gonna play, but you're not gonna start, and that was enough for him for him to kind of leave in a huff. Yeah. And that's that's the way I that's the way I seem to recall reading and interpreting what what led to his departure yeah well i mean garrett wilson when it's all said and done and maybe he won't have the records that some of the other decorated receivers at ohio state have but it's possible he's the best receiver that has ever come through ohio state i would agree with that i i i you know and you're talking we're old enough not that we like to you know you know, start yelling at kids to get off our lawn kind of a thing. But we're old enough to remember when a certain guy by the name of Chris Carter played, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, when you think about, you know, Chris Carter, you know, Terry Glenn, David Boston, Joey Joey Galloway, Joey Galloway. I mean, you could keep going on and on. Yeah. Um, You could make, you could make the argument. And, you know, I, I think like Chris Carter would not object to that. I really, I think like he, he has demonstrated, um, you know, to, you know, so many long time Ohio state fans that, that that is a legitimate possibility. Yeah. And that's, I mean, he's here at a time when Chris Olave is about to become the all time touchdown scoring leader among wide receivers for the team. And, and I think he would have tied it this week had he not had one erroneously called back. Uh, but it's it's hard to get on the field, and you when you do get on the field, you have to make your mark. You look at Julian Fleming, uh, Chip. He's not been able to make a mark, even in the game where where uh, Garrett Wilson wasn't in the game. He really didn't do much. Right. I mean, he's he's also been unfortunate, you know, like, with with injuries like his. Sure. You know, so 
you know, my, the, the hope is still there. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think it would, it, it bears mentioning that you met, you know, like you, you mentioned it and I think most fans recognize it. There's a lot of talent in that wide receiver room. So, okay. You peer ahead to, okay. In 2022. All right. That's kind of like Julian Fleming. It's, it's probably like a now or never type thing because Marvin Harrison Jr., Emeka Igbuka, they're not going to be patient. They're, they're going to try and seize, seize the moment. Yeah. So it's, it's definitely the kind of thing, like you said, like Julian Fleming, uh, you know, yeah, you know, like it's great that you had all these high school recruiting accolades, but I, I would agree that, you know, it's, it, the clock is kind of ticking for him. Yeah, and it's going to be a wide open competition next year because there's even more talent coming in. It's going to be a wide open wide receiver uh, competition like we haven't seen in a while because you've had guys the last several years that have come back from the, the you know, you've had some veterans returning. You kind of knew who was going to be up for those roles. And of course, um, you know, when Olave went off at the end of his freshman year, you knew he was going to be back and be a, become a starter. And you knew Garrett Wilson was going to become a starter. You could see that Jackson Smith and Jigba was going to become a star. So, yeah, it's going to be wide open in the spring, and it's going to be fun to watch uh, who emerges. I think that Emeka Ibuka looks like he's going to be a future phenom on this team. And um, you know, we've heard all of the great things that, the coaching staff have said about uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. So, yeah, there's a there's there's a lot of competition, and so we've al- always said, you know, when when Jamison Williams transferred, we said there's, this isn't going to be the last transfer out of the wide receiver room. No, uh, hopefully there won't be as as many. I mean, you know, because again, you know, it's like you know, Chris Olave is a senior. This is you know, like this coming Saturday is his last game in Ohio stadium. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you, it, it's strong speculation, but until he actually says, you know, Garrett Wilson, you know, like there's two, we don't need a bunch of people to become disgruntled yeah. and, and take the, the, the high talent level down. Um, we just need people to recognize like, Hey, when, when the opportunity presents itself, you have to seize it. Yeah. I'm actually, I mean, I'm not, I don't, I can't say that I'm surprised that Jameson Williams had success at Alabama. I can't say that. I'm kind of surprised that he was able to go there in the spring and become a starter right away. I, I thought that Alabama would have been a little bit more loaded up a wide receiver. Uh, but, you know, they did lose a lot in the draft. So, uh, I get, again, when you have a wide open, you know, competition, sometimes uh, there's, that's the time to emerge. Exactly. All right. So uh, only other thing I wanted to mention for a break is that Ben Christman has shed his black stripe. Been really bad about following the black stripe uh, removals. There's been several in November. So wanted to make sure we, we gave Ben a shout out at becoming a, a quote unquote real Buckeye. Yeah. And I mean, you just mentioned it and, you know, and again, you know, you want to talk about competition, you know, along that offensive line, you know, like you've got to you got to figure this this coming uh, off season and the spring. You know, a lot of these players, you know, in terms of if not necessarily starting, trying to get in that, you know, top. I guess you could say top ten because uh, mm-hmm. Ohio State really prides itself on the fact that you know, like on that too deep. Uh, you know, having players that are ready to go in at a moment's notice. So it, again, that's going to bear watching as well. Yeah, uh, let's quickly go through the champions because I forgot to do that earlier. Uh, CJ Stroud and Garrett Wilson were co-players of the game. Uh, Travion Henderson, Mayan Williams, Chris Olave, Jackson Smith and Jigba, uh, Mitch Rossi, Cade Stover, Luke Whipler, Thayer Munford, Matthew Jones, uh, Paris Johnson, Dewan Jones and Nicholas Petit Frere. And not Jeremy Ruckert though. Probably is, was, uh, I was going to say still being punished for transgressions from the Nebraska <laughs> game. Or so, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, on defense, Lathan Ransom was the defensive player of the game. I, we didn't mention him earlier, but this was his best game so far. Yeah, I would agree. Um, it, it definitely I, – I would agree also something with Ross, Ross Fulton has said is that it seems as though he might be playing out of position. 
I mean, that might be out of necessity mm-hmm. um, with the with the defensive coaching staff. So it'll be interesting to see what they might do with him next year. Yeah. Uh, Zach Harrison, Tommy Eichenberg, Steel Chambers, as we mentioned, Cameron Brown uh, were the defensive champions. Special teams player of the week was Chris Booker. So there you have it. All right. Uh, Chip, we're going to talk about the Big Ten, take our typical walk through the results, and then we'll get to the Michigan State talk. We'll do all of that right after this. And we are back. Chip, let us talk about the rest of the Big Ten. And we're going to start in Happy Valley, where the whiteout took place during the day. It's never good to see a whiteout during the day. And it was the Michigan Wolverines winning on the road. 21-17, very much getting this done with defense because Penn State's offense looked terrible. They can't run the ball. Um, credit to the Wolverines because I did. I, I really did think that Penn State would be able to do, do enough put it that yeah. way, you know, like against, you know, like a Wolverine offense that really had, you know, like is, is very, very dependent upon the running game. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I really did think, I thought Penn state would do it. Um, I agree completely that, you know, it's not, it's, it's not really a whiteout if it's being played <laughs> during the day. Um, but I'm sure it was, it was still a very difficult environment to, to win a game in. Yeah. I think for me, it looked to like, Penn State struggled in the red zone, and also it looked like Sean Clifford got hurt again in this game and played the rest of it hurt. It, it, they didn't call uh, – he didn't pull the ball down and run very often after about, I think, maybe even much, uh, as early as the start of the second quarter. Uh, it didn't seem like he was scrambling, didn't seem like he was doing any um, you know keepers. And th- when Penn State's one-dimensional like that, uh, they need to get the ball to Jahan Dotson. They weren't doing that, and when they did, he ran eight yards backwards. Chip. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It's going to be interesting to see. I mean, you know, for a team that you know started out so strongly, you know, at the beginning of the season, it just seems as though you know they've been sputtering, you know, down the down the home stretch, so to speak. So you know, already have. Uh, four losses um, and who's to say, you know, it's like with the, with the remaining games, you know, they might have a couple more. Um, I doubt that they'll get a couple, a couple more losses, but they, they very well could. If you, if Sean Clifford is, is hurt, like you suspect. Yeah. I mean, we saw that he, when he looked better uh, against Ohio state and then the next week he looked even better when he he was clearly feeling better, but he, he took some shots early in the game and there's one thing about Michigan's defense, they're very physical. Uh, also, Penn State's right tackle, I don't know who it is. I don't know if he played in the Ohio State game. If he did, then everyone should be fired on that defense because Penn State's right tackle is a human pylon. <laughs> well, he couldn't block I, anybody 1v1. And I get that Michigan has good defensive ends, but he could block no one. Well, then... It's not only that, it, it's a shame that the coaching staff didn't recognize, you know, that, that he needed, you know, some, some help on that side. Yeah. Well, uh, so Michigan is still on track that if Michigan's, you know, Michigan State has now slipped up, they will, you know, Michigan State holds the head to head tiebreaker against Michigan, so they need to finish better. The Michigan State. So Michigan in the weird position of needing Ohio State to beat Michigan State. And then if Michigan wins against Ohio State, Michigan could actually get to Indianapolis. I know. It, it's it's shaping up the way that we've always grown accustomed to, you know, the game being pivotal mm-hmm. for the Big Ten. So absolutely. Yeah, the scary thing about Michigan is you know they're going to give it to Hassan Haskins and he still goes for 156 yards. Yeah, well, I, you know, if anything, they've got, um, they've got to figure out besides Hassan Haskins. Um, granted, I mean, like it, it worked much, much to my surprise as well as it did against Penn State. Um, 
But I just think maybe not even necessarily against Ohio State down the road, like in like a bowl game or something, they've got to do some, something else to kind of expand that offense. Mm-hmm. Because I think it, against better teams, you know, they'll, they'll suffer dramatically as a result of being so one-dimensional. Yeah, Blake Corum, um, I don't think it's going to be out like long term. So they'll have at least uh, the lightning to go with the thunder back uh, before too long. Probably before Ohio State game, I'm guessing, or or at least for that game. Uh, Michigan State bounced back with a 40-21 to win over Maryland, and that was at East Lansing. Maryland 5-5, five and five, they had a chance to get to bowl eligibility, uh, and they are... Two and five in the Big Ten. Michigan State nine and one, six and one in the Big Ten. A good bounce back for the Spartans. Uh, Kenneth Walker the third. Boy, we're going to talk about him, Chip. 143 yards, two touchdowns. So another big day for him. Uh, Northwestern went to Wisconsin, and it went about how you expected because Wisconsin has been playing like Wisconsin the last couple weeks, and Northwestern has been bad all year. 35-7 Badgers. Yeah, and you know something? Wisconsin is finally playing like the team that I'll just say for myself. This is this is kind of what I expected at the beginning of the year. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, like this kind of a dominant performance. Now, granted, Northwestern's terrible um, this year, but uh, you know, Wisconsin—they're clearly in the driver's seat to to win the Big Ten West, which was not something we could have said a, a few short weeks ago. Yeah, it's interesting to me. Chip, this number two scoring defense in the country behind only Georgia is Wisconsin. Right. Yeah, they they are they are very underrated. Um, you know, if anything, you know, when the offense was kind of having its swoon, uh, when they weren't able to you know run the ball as well, and Graham Mertz wasn't really playing that well at quarterback, the defense was what kind of was keeping them afloat. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and you know Jim Leonard. As the defensive coordinator, uh, you know, he certainly would be, in my opinion, uh, if you're looking for, you know, a, a good up and coming young coach, I'm not saying necessarily at a premier program, but, you know, one of like a smaller program to kind of give him his head start, he would be an ideal person, I think, you know, for like a Midwestern, uh, Midwestern school. To, to target because I mm-hmm. think he's definitely he, he's definitely showing that he can do some great things. Now Wisconsin's defense has really rebounded because they got I mean they weren't very good against Notre Dame they weren't very good against Michigan. No, they weren't. But ever since I mean like they they've done what they needed to do you know in terms of um, you know taking care of business so to speak. Um, you know we were just talking about Purdue earlier. You know like they basically you know shut them down they crushed iowa i mean they, mm-hmm. they handled they handled uh rutgers um you know just talking about northwestern so they have you know a couple challenging games in the big 10 west still remaining but yeah like they they definitely did enough earlier in the season like you said like they didn't do well you know in some games but they they were what was keeping wisconsin competitive for most of the season yep Chip, every time you think that you know who w- might win the Big Ten West, everything gets shaken up over there. <laughs> like I said, yeah, I mean, it, it was, I, you know, like a few short weeks ago, it was Minnesota. I mean, it was Minnesota to, to run the table, and then that just kind of just went completely south. Yeah, you know, Minnesota like, won't tell us if they're good or not. That's the really frustrating thing. They just won't tell us. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I think, I mean, this they've got uh, an opportunity. We were just talking about Wisconsin. I mean, that's that's their big rivalry game um, the end of the year. So they have an opportunity to, you know, kind of make some noise there. But, yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely, you know, against Iowa this past weekend, didn't play well. Um, you know, the fact that, I mean, that they lost to Illinois – the fact that they lost to Bowling Green in non-conference. I mean, they're, they're just all these times where you, you were thinking, okay, they have opportunities to to really kind of announce that they're a viable option in the Big Ten West. They they Then they start falling apart. Yeah, and everybody has taken their turns falling apart. Iowa took their turn. Um, Wisconsin did it early. 
and is recovering from it. And now to the point that Wisconsin now is, uh, you know, with their win over Northwestern, they're five and two in the Big Ten. Iowa's five and two in the Big Ten. Wisconsin holds that tiebreaker. Yeah, and I think Wisconsin. I mean, they've got, uh, like I said, they they've got Nebraska, and, and Nebraska has their own set of issues um, that, in terms of how they're going to handle the remainder of 2021. Um, and then they've got Minnesota. I think Wisconsin is very well in prime position to win that big 10 West. Don't look now, Chip, but you and I are starting to look pretty good with our preseason picks. <laughs> uh, Wisconsin, well, Iowa, Minnesota is how we had it. And then yeah. we, we started to differ a little bit. I, I gave Nebraska more uh, credence than I should have because I thought they would start to win some of these one game, one score games. They did not. Um, I, we definitely both undersold Purdue. And, um, and, and even though I put Northwestern two from the bottom, I still overestimated Northwestern. (laughs) Oh, I, I, I definitely dramatically over overestimated Northwestern. I mean, they've got, you know, for the remainder of, I mean, like we were talking about Purdue, um, they're actually, they're doing, uh, they're, they're, playing Purdue, uh, but not at, not in Evanston. They're playing in Wrigley Field Mm -hmm. this coming weekend. So, um, but yeah, Northwestern, they look like they need to really reevaluate everything they're doing from top to bottom because, I mean, everything, the defense fell apart. That's always been a strong suit. Their offense just never really got on track um, this year. So I think Pat Fitzgerald, it's going to be a, a long off season for the Wildcats. Yeah. So we'll give that score. Iowa won against North uh, against Minnesota. I'm sorry, 27, 22. And, you know, it was a little bit of a back and forth game, but Iowa pulls that one out with a, uh, winning the fourth quarter and, uh, and then to round it out, Rutgers crushes Indiana 38 to three on the road and Rutgers is one win from bowl eligibility. And the thing is, we had joked about it in the in the preseason, but when you look ahead, and I know you know it's kind of you know like with Rutgers, like they're they're playing Penn State, mm-hmm. um, you know. So you know, I even with the unsure health of Sean Clifford, you know, you have to figure that Penn State, you know, should be able to take care of business there. Mm-hmm. But with the, the joke part was we had said, you know, with Maryland and Rutgers, it might come down to that last game. I mean, it really may come down to that last game for, you know, like to get that magic number six um, for, you know, for either team. Now, you know, you know, they Rutgers, if there's an advantage, they get Maryland coming to um, to them. Yeah. Um, The scat away. Yeah. So we'll see. Yeah. So you don't think Maryland's going to become bowl eligible against Michigan at home? Well, I like their passing game. Um, and nothing else about the I, team. I'm not, sure if they'll, <laughs> I'm not sure if, to be fair, um, because I, you know, I've had the opportunity to, I don't know if you, you know, like in terms of, you know, like on uh, like Big Ten Network or FS1, like they show the reruns of certain games. And so I was mm-hmm. able to catch not, you know, from start to finish, but like portions of that maryland michigan state game to kind of prepare me for you know like to kind of talk about michigan state Mm -hmm. um they did some things against michigan state that have me encouraged as an ohio state fan i don't know if they have enough defensively to slow down that wolverine running game that's that would be kind of how i would i would i would think that the, the wolverines might be able to just pound them um but it should be it should be interesting to say the least yeah all right speaking of the spartans chip Let's talk about them. And you just brought up a thing that I'm going to tell you a little bit about. And that, that, I'm going to start on the defensive side of the ball for Michigan State. They have the 41st ranked scoring defense. That sounds pretty low. They're averaging, uh, giving uh, 22.5 points per game. Um, That's not a lot in today's college football, 22 points a game. Um, and they have a good run defense, 20th in the country, allowing 114 yards per game. But I don't know if this is a chicken and egg situation because their passing defense is dead last in NCAA Division One, 329 yards per game the Spartans are giving up through the air. 
they can't stop anything. And so I'm wondering, is their rush defense good because people are just passing all over them and not having to run? You know, what's <laughs> or or is the is the reverse true that they're getting passed all over because they've stopped the run? I don't know. They have the 111th total defense though in the country. They're giving up 443 yards per game. That tells me that Ohio State's going to score points. Yes. Um, and again, I, the, the the question, you know, like kind of like that chicken or the egg type uh, type conundrum, you know, I, I really couldn't begin to tell you in terms of, you know, are they passing because they, they give up on the run or, you know, vice versa. You know, I, I really don't know. Um, I do know that, for a team that looked as dreadful as they did last year, um, understandably, like it was a COVID year for everybody. But I mean, mm-hmm. for you know, for Mel Tucker to come in without not only the advantage of spring practice, I mean, it was you know like that. The fact that that the Spartans were able to to get two wins last year, you know, one of which was on the road at Michigan. Um, and then they also beat Northwestern, who eventually wound up being the Big Ten West champion. Um, I think that speaks volumes about the job that Mel Tucker is doing with that team. Now, granted, um, got to give credit where credit is due. Mel Tucker really, I, I mean, you want to talk about like a master course in mining the, <laughs> the transfer portal uh, to its extent. Um, I, you know, in terms of like the exact number, but I want to say that they have like 20 new players, um, all from the transfer portal on this year's roster. So, you know, it's like the defense. Yeah. It's not nearly as good as I'm sure, um, Mel Tucker would like it to be, but I think that it's kind of, he's, he's doing the best he can, you know, with, you know, filling in holes and, and finding players that, uh, suit, um, I, I guess like maybe the the demeanor, if you will, that, that he wants for the program going forward. Yeah, I will say that in the preseason, when you picked Michigan State to finish last in the East, I stuck up for Mel Tucker and I said, mm-hmm. I believe in Mel Tucker. Chip, I only believed in him to finish in fifth place in the East. Well, okay. Well, I want to give, credit, give you credit, though, because... You know, it was one of these things where, you know, like not knowing um, anything at all about how good um, Kenneth Walker was going to be. You know what I mean? Like, I, yeah. you know what I mean? It's like, I think, you know, I give you credit because, you know, it, I'm, I'm looking at it thinking like, okay, well, Ohio State crushed those guys, you know, by 40 points. They beat them 52 to 12 with a revamped offensive line. When they went on the road and mm-hmm. they, you know, like they had all these COVID issues and they were still able to beat them by 40 points, I thought, okay, there's no way that this team is going to be, you know, uh, you know, like, I mean, I would have, you know, if, if, if you had said, okay, what do you, you know, what do you think the odds are that Michigan State is going to be, you know, have only one loss in late November when they come in? come into Columbus. I right. mean, I, I, you know what I mean? Like, right. Well, and even me, I mean, I believe that Mel Tucker was turning the ship around, but I, I mean, I didn't have them that high. I mean, but oh, I, sure. I also didn't, I also didn't hold and I will never hold like getting your butt kicked by Ohio state is not necessarily something that I would even use as a barometer because that was an Ohio state team that went to the final against Alabama. Oh yeah. I just meant, you know, based on what I saw, Right. You know what I mean? In terms of, okay, like, man, there, that is a, that is a substantial talent differential, Yeah, you know, in terms of, and for him to have a team that is, you know, within, you know, viable possibilities of winning the big 10 East, um, you know, compared to a year ago. I mean, like that is amazing. I mean, you want to talk about, having faith in Mel Tucker. I don't know if you happen to see it before we started recording. And again, it's, it's just a report. It's not confirmed, Mm -hmm. but supposedly there are some deep pocketed boosters uh, at Michigan state who are prepared to reward Mel Tucker handsomely 
with a new 10 year contract extension worth $95 million. That would make him the highest paid coach in college football to kind of basically keep, you know, all of the, you know, like the other suitors like LSU who were supposedly very strongly interested in hiring Mel Tucker, keep them away. Mm -hmm. Well, I can tell you that a move like that has never once backfired. (laughs) (laughs) Um, yeah, I think it's a great story, uh, and you hit the nail on the head with he has he has done his homework and he's worked hard to get where he's at. Going to get in Kenneth Walker the third. I mean, how did Kenneth Walker the third? How did he end up at Wake Forest to begin with? This guy is leading the country in rushing. Yeah, and I'm kind of curious. I mean, I'm just kind of, you know, like you said, how did he wind up at Wake Forest? But I'm wondering. How did he, you know, in terms of why did they let him go? Because he ran for well over a thousand yards last year for Wake Forest. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like it's not as though okay, Wake Forest has this abundance of you know offensive you know talent that they could just casually let somebody go um, without putting up a fight. Now, granted, I mean there might have been some extenuating circumstances. All I know is the Spartans are the prime beneficiaries of Kenneth Walker's emergence as a legitimate Heisman Trophy candidate. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, Wake Forest is leading the Atlantic uh, Conference, uh, the the, uh, ACC Atlantic. Uh, So they're doing quite well. But Kenneth Walker has almost three times the rushing yards as Wake Forest's leading rusher. Okay, right there. You know, like you're talking about, okay, three times. I mean, that that just kind of speaks volumes right there about the worth he had mm-hmm. um, on that team. So I'm just kind of kind of curious as to why there haven't been more stories within the within the media about why he even left. I mean, did he go to Wake Forest to use it as a platform to get to a better program? Maybe. It's entirely possible. Uh, I don't. I don't. I don't really know. I haven't. I haven't taken a deep dive into the Kenneth Walker uh, story. I'm sure we'll hear quite a bit about him on the broadcast on Saturday. Uh, but yeah, Wake Forest is doing quite well. I mean, he had to know that that was a pretty decent team. Clemson has stumbled this year, so that opened the door for Wake Forest. Wake Forest currently has a two-game lead in the Atlantic um, here late in the season. So they look like they're going to play for, for an ACC championship. And Kenneth Walker it was just a – well, I mean, if things fall the right way, he could still play for a Big Ten championship. It's entirely possible. Yeah, like, it, I mean, in terms of, um, you know, when it came to, um, you know, Wake Forest, you know, Dave Clawson is, is definitely one of those underrated coaches in terms of, you know, like, you know, he has – you know, certainly has – Wake Forest well positioned. Mm-hmm. Um, the other surprise team of the ACC, the Pitt Panthers. Um, mm-hmm. You know, yeah. like that's that's kind of you know it's like that's what it's like. Yeah, you know, we were taught we were joking about it, but it's true. It's like okay, what what seems more unlikely? You know that um, that Michigan State is going to have only one loss in late November, or your two possible teams winning the ACC are are the Wake Forest uh, uh, Demon Deacons or, or the Pittsburgh Panthers in 2021. I mean, like, nobody would have believed that that was, that was even an, an option. Yeah, the ACC is definitely weird. Uh, oh, there's yeah. all kinds of weirdness going on this year. Um, like, for example, the last place team in the Atlantic is Boston College, Jeff Halfley's Boston College Eagles. They're 2-4 and four in conference, but they're already bowl eligible. Jeff, yeah, Jeff Halfley, I think he is doing what he can. I mean, he has them playing hard, um, you know, like, and, and they're defensively sound. Um, but, yeah, I mean, who's to, who's to say? I mean, it, it's just so difficult to, to figure out. They, yeah. they also lost their quarterback, too, which I think kind of impacted mm-hmm. uh, their role within the ACC. Yeah, you just don't normally see a last place team in a division already being you know, being bowl eligible. That's not a normal thing. Oh, right. Exactly. <laughs> so exactly. craziness in the ACC. But getting back to Michigan State Spartans, 
Uh, they have the 26th rated scoring offense. They're scoring 34 points a game, 34.6 points per game. They have the 29th rated rushing offense. I would have thought that would have been higher, but they are rated 29th, 197.8 yards per game. Passing offense is 49th, 251 yards a game, and total offense is 24th in the country, 448.9 yards per game. It's a lot of yards. I mean, that's a, a offense that's been moving the ball. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, in terms of when you when you look at offensively, they are certainly, you know, they they are more than just Kenneth Walker. You know, they they actually, in terms of, you know, what has been a pleasant surprise. You know, Peyton Thorne at quarterback. Uh, you know, we we talked earlier about uh, with Penn State. Uh, you know, the the dual threat. You know, that Sean Clifford presents. Peyton Thorne is exactly in that that same kind of category. You mm-hmm. know, in terms of, you know. Uh, you know, he's a threat with his legs. Uh, he emerged at quarterback, you know, wide receiver. Jaden Reed is definitely uh, their best, you know, wide receiver option. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they're, they are certainly more than just Kenneth Walker, you know, at, at running back. Yeah, so the Buckeyes are going to have to worry about the secondary. going to have to worry about Jaden Reed and Jalen. Jaden and Jalen Naylor. Yep. Uh, those are the two big threats. Uh, you can – rattle Peyton Thorne you can you, he does have bad games here and there he's uh he's you know he wasn't great in the Purdue game for example um but uh you know he's been efficient 63 percent passer 21 touchdowns against eight interceptions so he does put the ball in harm's way sometimes uh but 2400 yards passing he's been he's been pretty good for them and like you mentioned, he can make plays with his feet. He's the third leading rusher on the team, although on just 147 yards. But you got to factor in sack yards too as well. Uh, but behind Kenneth Walker, it's really no run game. Um, Jordan Simmons, their second leading rusher, has only 47 attempts this season for 230 yards. So, uh, but Kenneth Walker is uh, he's getting it done. <laughs> he's leading the country in uh, in rushing yards and. Uh, He's not far behind Travion Henderson for rush uh, for yards per attempt either. No, uh, yeah, Kenneth Walker. I mean, is you know, <laughs> it's gonna sound familiar. Uh, you know, that's kind of you know from a week ago we were like, okay, shut down David Bell. Uh, that should be the first priority. I mean, okay, different opponent, different style of attack. Yeah. Instead of a receiver, you you focus on the running game. Um, you know, again, I think putting the trust in the secondary to do their job against, you know, Jane Reed, Jalen Naylor. Um, but I think it's going to be all hands on deck about slowing down Kenneth Walker. I think, Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that, that will be the, the, the primary, I would presume the primary focus of the defensive coaching meetings this week. Yeah. And the, another focus should be watch for the flea flicker. Yes. This team has run like five of them this year. Yeah. I well, think they ran three in one game, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> they're, they're, I, like I said, you know, I, I think Mel Tucker, I mean, it's like, okay, we're going to pull out all the stops. And, you know, I, I can't be critical of a guy that, you know, again, you know, I predicted last in the Big Ten East and just goes to show it's like he certainly knew – what kind of team he had, and he is not afraid to be unconventional to get the job done. Yeah. Very important game for the Ohio State offensive line, Chip, because, you, like I mentioned, they're, they're last in passing defense, but they do have some guys that can get to the quarterback. Their defensive ends, Jeff Petrowski and Jacob uh, Panasiak, uh, five and a half sacks each from those defensive end spots. Uh, they will send the safety at times, um, but that's, I think, kind of out of necessity. I think they're... They're a high risk defense, but they get rewarded sometimes. So you have to you have to make sure you don't miss when they give you opportunities. Yeah, um, we talked about this a couple weeks ago with Nebraska. My frustration, and I know a lot of other fans, um, with uh, C.J. Stroud um, not running to um, you know in the event like to extend plays. Th- it might be a necessity. Um, it might be a necessity against Michigan State. And again, just to clarify this, I am not suggesting going back to I, – I, the last thing in the world I want is for him to be hurt, uh, especially considering the precarious nature of 
his shoulder from earlier in the season. I am suggesting you drop back to pass um, if, you know, it looks like, okay, that your, you know, outlet, uh, you know, receiver is not available. I'm saying, you know, turn up field if you can get some positive yardage, you know, slide and or get to the sideline. Um, mm-hmm. That's what I'm talking. That's what I like. In this, and I, again, based on what you were saying is that they can get to the quarterback. It's like, okay, sometimes, you know, you know, being able to dart up field and get three, four five yards slide that, you know, like that helps to slow down that pass rush. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like that, that kind of, oh, okay. Like we can't, uh, you know, we can't just keep coming after this guy because he's making us pay. Yeah. And another thing that they could do is get the ball out quick. You remember early in the season, we saw a lot of quick throws to the sidelines. We haven't seen those in a few weeks. Maybe, maybe they'll make a resurgence against Michigan state. Yeah. All right, Chip, it is time for us to determine what we believe is going to happen and lay our our cards on the table. We're going to start with our picks to click. Now, last week okay. we, started, uh, we started on defense. We're going to start on offense. I need your offensive pick to click, Mr. Uh, Mr. Minnick. <laughs> All right. Um, you know something? It is going to be... I'm going to say that I'm going to go with Mayan Williams. Um, I saw enough of him this past week in terms of, you know, being that guy that after a while, like, I don't want to tackle this guy anymore. Like, this is not, a, this is not fun mm-hmm. trying to tackle, t- trying to tackle this fire hydrant that is running at me with a lot of anger and a lot of velocity. So I'm going to go with Mayan Williams. All right. I am going to go with getting the ball out quickly to Jackson Smith and Jigba. I'm taking Jackson Smith and Jigba in this game. Okay. So that brings us to the defensive side of the ball and I I don't know. I don't like I don't like taking the same guy two weeks in a row, but I kind of feel like Ronnie Hickman will have a a better game this week. Um I think I'll take Steel Chambers this week. <laughs> Um, we do need to see some tackling. I think that he'll be one of the guys tasked with stopping uh, Kenneth Walker, and uh, I think Hickman will as well be involved in stopping the run. Obviously, they're they're gonna have to commit numbers to stopping the run. They're gonna have to the, it's gonna have to be a team effort, and I think it's going to be a very important game for the defensive lineman, the interior defensive lineman. The Haskell Garrett's gonna have to be. The Haskell Garrett we saw last year, I think we're going to need to see more. I want to see more Tyleek Williams in there. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that I, I, I was laughing because yeah, steel chambers was going to be my guy. He was um, going to be your guy. Was oh yeah. Eat. No. So it's yeah. like, yeah, no, like, um, but I mean, for the same reasons that you, that you cited, it mm-hmm. was, I was thinking, okay, if there was ever, if there was ever a guy who could mirror, Kenneth Walker, I mean, mm-hmm. a former running back, and you know, basically, I'm not saying he's that Kenneth Walker is not gonna, um, not be, not gain yards against Ohio State, but I think Steel Chambers, I think this is where he's gonna show his his playmaking ability at that linebacker position. I I, I think he he definitely, um, I, I'm with you. I think he's he's gonna have a, a good game. I'm gonna go with Ronnie Hickman simply because he's he really has become kind of that utility player for Ohio state defensively in the sense of not only in terms of run support. um, I think he will be necessary in terms of uh, in, in terms of the secondary, you know, like you said, he didn't have a great game last week, but I think just that utility, that utility type role he has. So I'll, I'll go with Ronnie Hickman for this game. We have been riding the Ronnie Hickman and Steel Chambers well, train this year. <laughs> well, well, it's 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 kind of difficult. With, yeah, you know, like when when you think about the whole defense, you know, like you know, in terms of um, the the defensive line, um, the the linebackers. Let's face it, you know, like the linebackers have not really played as well as anyone would have expected. Um, and the secondary, like it, it sometimes is hit or miss. I almost went with Denzel Burke, but it, I, I really think that, like I said from a moment ago, I think Ronnie Hickman just 
in run support as well as pass coverage. I think that's why it's a, it's a solid pick. Yeah, you look at early in the year, we were taking defensive ends a lot. We were taking uh, interior defensive linemen sometimes. Um, Hickman we started on pretty early in the season. But this is two weeks in a row that Chambers and Hickman were taken. And it's three weeks in a row that Hickman was taken. And it's three out of the last four that Chambers was taken. Actually, Hickman's been taken, uh, what, one, two, three, four, four games in a row. Well... I mean, I think the results speak for themselves in terms of, <laughs> yeah. you know, like leading, you know, in terms of, now I granted he didn't lead the team in tackles this past week, but I think he's leading the team in tackles, you know, overall. I don't yeah. have the stats in front of me. So I'm just saying, you know, it makes sense. Yeah. And like I said, this week, I mean, he put seven tackles up on the board. I just didn't think that, um, I just didn't give him a click because he, he just, uh, Oh sure. Was part of the oh, secondary that was that was blowing assignments uh, and I, you know you can't it's hard to tell whose assignment was getting blown maybe it was just flooding a, a zone that kind of thing but um right. at the same time you know you give up 31 points and you're in the secondary and all of it came through the air so um that just brings us to our score predictions. I've already typed mine in. So I'm <laughs> I'm locked in. And I'm not changing it. So what do you got for a final oh, score wow. this week? Okay. Senior right. day. Senior, Senior day is going to be emotional. It's going to be – I think Michigan State has played Ohio State tougher in Columbus than in East Lansing the last several years. What do you think is going to happen on Saturday? Um, I've, I've got it. Ohio State – I'm going to go Ohio State 41, Michigan State 28. All right. You and I are so, so uh, close in the way we think. In the way we think is very similar. I have 45 to 27. There you go. So we're one point different. Yeah. (laughs) I'm just, I'm hoping Ohio State can play well against the run and force a couple field goals. Um, and, uh, And I like... Ohio State's passing offense against the passing defense of the Spartans. Um, Olave in his you know last game in Ohio Stadium probably should have taken Olave, um, but I just feel like uh, Smith and Jigba is going to going to. I mean, honestly, all three receivers could click. <laughs> it's they just could. The, <laughs> they they very well could um, against a defense like this. Uh, and you know, I kind of want to. Uh, since I get to pick offense first next week, I kind of want to pick Alave against the Wolverines. So um, that's one that was part of my thinking. So I, I don't know. I, I think that this is an offense that can score points on the Spartans. It's going to be up to the defense to not make this track meet and to be able to not give up big plays to Walker in the run game because he can hit home runs in the running game. They've got to play sound defense. They've got to be disruptive on the, the defensive linemen have to rally to the ball or they have to kind of uh, keep those offensive linemen from getting to the second level, keep guys clean. And and I think that they can do that. I agree. But we will find out Saturday at noon. We got two big nude kickoffs in a row. I think this is also, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, game day is going to be there. That's right. The game day is coming to Columbus. So for all of you fans who, you know, get up for that kind of thing, you know, you'll you probably want to get down to, you know, I'm not sure where, I mean, it's usually, you know, on the other side of St. John arena, I think um, yeah. in years past. So, yeah. you know, get down to, get down to campus early. Yeah. I don't care about any of that. <laughs> like everybody was announcing it when they, when that came out last week, they were, or at the beginning of the week, they're all like, Oh, game day's coming to Columbus game day. Game. And it was like, my whole timeline was game day is going to be Columbus. And I was like, so what? Yeah, I, <laughs> I, 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 I mean, I mean, I, I freely admit, you know, like back in 2002 for the Ohio State Washington State game, I was up on the stands, um, you know, with you know a couple friends of mine um, behind Herb Street, and my wife saw me on television um, ah, okay. at one point. But that's yeah, that like most of the time, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I'm, I'm yeah. kind of like, yeah, it's not really that big of a deal. I used to watch it way back, but then it just, it, you know, like everything, it eventually becomes a parody of itself. And I was like, yeah, oh, this isn't really even fun to watch anymore. 
So I stopped watching it. I well, yeah, and of course you've got the Lee Corso headgear selection yeah. moment. So you do, and that's you never know. That's still kind of fun, but that's probably the only reason I would even t- tune in. It's like if I tune in like three minutes before the game starts, you know, then I'll get to see that part, and I'll get to not hear anything that Desmond says, and that's a big plus in my book. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> that 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 makes complete sense. All right, Chip. Well, we'll come back next week. We will see how we did with our predictions against Michigan State. We'll see if Ohio State is still on track for a collision course with the Wolverines for the right to go to the Big Ten championship game. And we will, of course, preview the game. I know. So before we do that, let's tell everybody where they can find us online. Okay, I can be found on Twitter at Chip Minnick. Last name is spelled M-I-N-N-I-C-H. And I am, besides a podcaster with Michael, I am a contributor to Athlonsports.com. All right, you can find me on Twitter at Mike36Fan. And you can read the grumpy old Buckeye column that I write every Sunday, the day after a game. I will tell you what I was complaining about to absolutely nobody. Uh, in the privacy of my own man cave <laughs> out <laughs> out loud still, even though nobody's here. Uh, yeah, that's, that's what that column's for is to get my gripes out and, uh, you know, just to, it's a little cathartic. So, uh, you can check it out at BuckeyeScoop.com and, uh, be sure to check out all the other podcasts on BuckeyeScoop.com because there's a lot of very, very talented podcasters. And even if you don't want to listen to 17 Buckeye weeklies every week, you maybe listen to four or five. Precisely. Yeah. All right, Chip. We will come back next week and uh, we'll do this again. And um, it's 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 hard to believe we're almost to the game. Oh, we always say it though. It goes by so fast. You got to savor savor the moments when you have them. Indeed. All right, that'll do it for us. We will be back next week. The only thing is left for us to do is to say go bucks go bucks